Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. Welcome to Screenwalks. My name is Marco De Mutis, and I'm digital curator at Photomuseum Winterthur in Switzerland. Screenwalks is a collaborative program launched by Photomuseum Winterthur and the Photographers Gallery, supported by Pro Helvetia. Screenwalks is a fortnightly program of live streamed events led by artists, curators, and researchers, accompanying us to explore the digital environments where their work takes place. Through this series, we attempt to shed light on contemporary practices and novel form in which digital network images are changing the role of photography and redefine visual culture. Each event is somehow different and shaped by our guests who might turn their screen walk into a live performance, a tutorial, an online expedition, a speed run, a takeover, a studio visit, and whatever format allowed within the limitation of our setup. Please check our YouTube and Twitch channels to discover our previous events. If this is your first time with us and you're joining us on Zoom, your microphones should be muted. If not, please go ahead and mute them now. The event will be recorded and will be archived. So please turn off your camera if you don't want to be recorded. If you have any questions throughout the event, please send them to John or me in a private message or write them directly on the public chat. Hello all, um, my name is Jero Riarte, curator digital of the Photographers Gallery in London. Tonight, uh, we'll be looking to one of the most influential territories of corporate network with American artist uh, and writer, uh, Jenny Odell. Departing from her written visual and, um, and visual essay, uh, Excavating Calabasas Creek, an inefficient route through Silicon Valley, Jenny will share personal, historic, and network materials in order to investigate the history and development of Silicon Valley. Uh, Jenny Odell is a multidisciplinary art writer based in California. Her work generally involves acts of observation, whether it's bear watching, collecting screenshots, trying to parse bizarre forms of e-commerce, or any other ways of observation. She is uh, author of New York Times best-selling book, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, which was published by Melville House in 2019. Writing and artworks importantly points uh, to the ways in which attention, lack thereof, leads to consequential shifts in perception at the level of the everyday. From Google view images to San Francisco dams, from YouTube screenshot to satellite imaginary, Odell has carefully collected images, words, and objects, and has explored narratives of archival practices. She has successfully researched the specificities of different materials in her previous, in her previous projects. But uh, tonight, uh, she uh, will show us that she is also able to move in fluid way across born digital and printed materials, mixing different sources. Her work has been at the Contemporary Jewish Museum, the New York Public Library, uh, Rincon Darles, the Photomuseum Winter Tour, the Photography Festival, and many other places. And her writing has appeared in New York Times, New York Magazine, that SFMO Mass Open Space and among other uh, places and, and publications. Uh, she also teaches digital art at Stanford University. And uh, we are very happy to have her uh, with us uh, tonight. So uh, Jenny, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. The, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me and, and for that introduction. Um, Super happy to virtually be here. Um, and also if my connection gets bad, just let me know and I'll switch to, I have another option for Wi-Fi. So um, yeah, so I am going to share my screen. And, okay. So there we go. Um, so I, um, I wanted to actually first just give a little bit of context um, about why I researched this creek in Silicon Valley. Um, it's in my book, How to Do Nothing, um, in chapter four, which is about kind of learning to pay new kinds of attention, especially to overlooked um, environments, familiar environments. Um, but kind of more specifically, I want to give a really big shout out to uh, the Prelinger Library, which is um, in San Francisco. I'm in Oakland. Um, so uh, the Prelinger Library is a, it's kind of like hybrid digital physical um, archive. It's run by Rick and Megan Prelinger. Um, they have a lot of connections with the Internet Archive. And um, you can see this is a physical space, but um, a lot of the 
things in here are digitized and it's really emphasized as it's open to the public, it, um, but it's run by Rick and Megan. Um, and it's, there's a lot of emphasis on ephemera, maps, um, just kind of things you wouldn't find <laughs> um, in the traditional public library. Um, and so, um, sorry, I'm just checking something really quick. Um, okay. Um, and so the Prelinger Library uh, runs a series of talks called Place Talks. Um, and for Place Talks, artists are invited to pick a place, of course, like what counts as a place is a very fluid thing, um, and then give a, a talk on that. And so I had chosen to uh, this creek um, that I had sort of come across in my research um, that I wanted to do kind of a deep dive on. And so I, I did a lot of my research um, at the Prelinger Library. Um, but I think I'm, I'm also mentioning them because I think that their whole ethos is very um, related to like my approach, which is to mix archival physical print things together with um, things that you would find online and kind of trying to move back and forth across those and kind of triangulate. Um, so I'm going to be sort of uh, giving a version of that um, talk, but, but with more, I uh, want to kind of give you more direct sense of like some of the materials that I was looking at. Um, so, oops, okay. so uh, this is a picture that I took of Cupertino. Um, I grew up in Cupertino, um, which you may know as the home of Apple and which is kind of synonymous with Silicon Valley. Um, and if you had told teenage Jenny that I would have anything to say about Cupertino, um, I would have been surprised because my experience of Cupertino is basically this. Um, interchangeable shopping centers, office parks, six lane roads with eternal traffic lights. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense, this is from uh, a newspaper clipping. This is a very Prelinger Library thing. The Prelinger Library has a series of books that were made by this man named Norm Thurkelson, who is not an official archivist, um, not an official historian. Um, but for 50 years, he cut out all of the newspaper articles in many different newspapers um, by neighborhood in San Francisco and other um, places in the Bay Area and glued them onto these large sheets of paper. And then the front and the back cover is um, like from a drawing pad. And uh, he, he stopped doing them and he tried to donate them to the San Francisco Public Library. And the library was basically like, these are too weird. We don't know what to do with these. Like these are obviously important, but the format is very strange. So they, they pointed him to the Prelinger Library, which is where I encountered them. Um, and so I found this in one of Norm Thurkelson's booklets. Um, it is a portrait of a slurb, which is supposed to be um, like, I guess, a version of like a suburb and a slum. <laughs> um, and like the technology that comes out of Cupertino, my slurb uh, felt disconnected from place and time, somehow equally aspatial and ahistorical. So kind of like nothing to grab onto conceptually. Um, and so a few years ago, I started idly researching Rancho Rinconada, which is the Cupertino subdivision that I grew up in. Um, and that's me and Rancho Rinconada. Um, it was built very quickly in the 1950s, and it was made up of explicitly knockoff Eichler homes. So Eichler, if you're not familiar, um, was kind of the, a mid-century modern architect who was known for these houses that you'll be seeing <laughs> knockoff versions of, but they're kind of like ranch style houses, um, very 50s, 60s, um, lots of big windows. Sometimes there was like an inner courtyard, but like generally pretty small. Um, I call it the mid-century modern version, or I, I call my neighborhood the mid-century modern version of the McMansion. Um, so there's, that's the house that I grew up in. Um, and this is an ad that I found for Rancho Rinconada. Um, so these hastily assembled cookie cutter houses apparently sold for $89.50 each. That's 83,000 US dollars with inflation. Um, and unbeknownst to me, my entire neighborhood had been built from scratch almost overnight, um, only about 30 years before I was born. So I found, this is on Wikipedia, I found this aerial photo of my neighborhood as it was being built. And I was started switching back and forth between this and Google Maps. 
Um, this picture was taken in the 1950s and I was able to figure out, it's not labeled, but I basically labeled it myself. Um, and I was able to figure out what the streets were, uh, where my house is in here, the house that I grew up in. Um, but there's this wiggly bit on the left that you can see. Um, and it kind of confused me because it didn't seem to correspond to any roads. And after a while, I realized that it wasn't a road. Um, it was a creek. So um, I'll show you. Why is this not letting me down? Okay. Um, so here, this is, um, I just wanted to give like a geographical sense of where I'm talking about. Um, and uh, wait, sorry, can you all, uh, John or Marco, can you all see this? I just wanted to double check the map. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We see the map. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, up here, you know, San Francisco, I'm here in Oakland now. Um, Palo Alto is here. Um, this is the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, we just had a big fire. Actually, there's big fires everywhere here. Um, and uh, Stanford over here. Okay, so here's Cupertino. And the area that I am talking about is right here. Okay, um, so Rancho Micanada. Um, and this is the wiggly bit that I was seeing right here. So this is Saratoga Creek. Um, and so I was looking at this and I realized like, oh, there's another creek over here too. Why haven't I sort of noticed that or thought about that? Um, this Creekside Park is actually for my former elementary school where I went to kindergarten. Um, and so I started thinking about it and I realized that the creek actually does show up in one place in my memory. Um, and so I got out the, <laughs> the yearbook from that uh, school and um, the creek is behind the fence in these photos. Um, I remember it as a place where if your ball went over the fence, you couldn't get it back. And I do have one memory of, of that happening and looking into this kind of like tangle of like trees and shrubs and having like maybe some understanding that this is a creek and that's it. That's like, that's it as far as this, <laughs> this creek shows up in my attention. Um, and so I, I probably saw it many times after that. Maybe I drove over it or something like that, but it never like really registered. Um, so Calabasas, it's called Calabasas Creek. For the most part, it isn't buried, but I called this talk excavating Calabasas Creek because of how I had to dig it out from under my own inattention. It's something hidden in plain sight, a symbol of the natural history that never quite surfaced in my consciousness growing up. And in going back to look at the creek um, on maps and then I went in person, I also came to appreciate it for the unusual route that it takes through Silicon Valley, um, half natural, half infrastructural, a true Anthropocene idol. Um, following it is like a lifeline out of that ahistorical, aspatial slurb, allowing me to look at the overhyped from the point of view of the forgotten the endless present from the point of view of the past and the digital from the view of the insistently physical. So I'm gonna give, I'm gonna use Calabasas Creek to give you a little tour of Silicon Valley. Um, so bring this map up. So this is, um, these are, this is me basically like figuring out different crossings and places that I might go and take photos. But I, I organized this tour into four general parts. And the first one is up here um, in Sunnyvale. And this is mostly like data centers. Um, and this is where the creek is very um, infrastructural. It's basically just a concrete channel. Um, the second part will be um, where it goes through. Um, no, I can't find it. Uh, oh, yeah, here goes through the Apple campus. That's the infinite, uh, or the spaceship campus, the, the new Apple campus. Um, and then I'll talk about this weird area called Main Street Cupertino and this really strange mall that it goes through. And then um, I'll end by talking about how the headwaters. So I'm going, this is in Saratoga. So I'm going backwards, I'm going upstream basically, um, which reflects how I encountered it coming from Oakland, I went south and I was kind of like making my way up. Um, so, okay, so I'll go back to Sunnyvale. Um, like I said, Sunnyvale, 
um, is mostly data centers and it's a very straight line as you can see um, there. Um, so before it gets to that straight line area, um, this is one of many USGS maps that I scanned at the Pellinger Library. Um, so originally it joined up with Saratoga Creek, which is that other creek that I, I uh, noticed first. Um, and then in the six or yeah, late 50s, um, I don't remember exactly what year it was, um, it was routed away from Saratoga Creek into its current concrete channel. Um, and this is mostly done for flood control reasons, which is an ongoing problem as pavement re replaced soil and water, um, or re replaced soil and water could no longer be absorbed and as it accumulated, um, which is only more and more of a problem. Um, creeks in this area flooded catastrophically numerous times, especially in the 1950s as the slurps were starting to come in. So, uh, and then in 1918, floods actually destroyed half of the local prune crop and in 1952, they caused $700,000 worth of damage to roads and bridges. Um, that's 6 million adjusted for inflation. Um, and so I was kind of curious about this rerouting and this was the first of my um, correspondences with the lovely Santa Clara Water Department who is, has rebranded themselves Valley Water. But I just want to say like, so unexpectedly helpful and just generous uh, throughout. Um, and so, you know, I'm, uh, I, I don't even remember like how I introduced myself to them. I was basically just like an artist who was curious about this creek. So I asked about this rerouting um, and they created this whole like folder for me of files. Um, and so one of the things they sent me um, was this engineering document, which um, is where you can see the actual decision to make this rerouting. Um, and I, the reason I find this interesting is that um, it's just a very, um, a reminder of how indistinguishable an urban creek is from any other kind of infrastructure. Um, the water kind of just goes where we say it goes. It's like just something to be dealt with um, versus like a natural channel. So um, when I was doing my research, I would, I was making that map of crossings and I would kind of just check on street view first before I went to make sure that that's where the creek goes through. Um, and then I would go there in person um, and I was making these um, photos and like <laughs> shaky videos. Um, but everything in between this point and the creeks headwaters in the Santa Cruz mountains is sort of a gradient between natural and man-made. Um, in the hills, it's a natural stream bed by my old school. It's these cement bags and imported rocks. And ultimately it ends up here in a concrete channel. Uh, and it made me wonder when is a creek still a creek or what even is a creek? Um, the character of the creek here seems almost appropriate to its surroundings, which I would call a landscape of efficiency, a no man's land of squat, unadorned architecture. So I'll read you some of the names of the places that the creek passes by. Um, Terex Computer Services, Mellanox Technologies, Loco Labs, Omniig, Ologic, Go Engineer, Nanosyn, Resilient, not resilient, Resilient. Zenitram Manufacturing, Impact Group, Sonoscan, Gugain, Affymetrics, and Centrify Corporation. Um, as far as what happens in these places, some of them are electronic parts manufacturers, some of them make surveillance systems, and many of them are data centers. Watching the water flow through the concrete channel, I think about the flows happening inside these buildings and how different they are. Streams of requests and information coming in and out unpredictably from any place at any time. A data center is about as close to a non-place as you can get. If it could do away with space and time, it would. Um, for example, the image that Terex Computer Services uses on its website is not of its interior, but a stock photo of some data center somewhere, an image that it shares with countless other sites and companies. Um, but some of these companies become grounded in this place in at least one way. Um, so this is the site for um, uh, EPA um, Superfund sites. If you don't know what a Superfund site is, uh, it's the 
United States Environmental Protection Agency's list of um, sites that are so polluted that they require like a, a long-term systematic approach to cleanup. So, um, you know, like metal metals contamination in water, um, you know, just sites that have been for agricultural or industrial reasons, just like extremely polluted. Um, so this is a very helpful site where you can search for super fun sites where you live. Um, and you can see um, these are the super fun sites in Sunnyvale. Um, something that a lot of um, people, even the Bay Area, don't know is that um, there are so many super fun sites in Sunnyvale because of computer chip manufacturing in you know in the 20th century, uh, the byproducts from that. So um, there was a very physical cost to that. Um, so here's the super fun map and. Um, there's Sunnyvale. And the creek does not show up on this map, but it's basically right here, kind of between where it says Sunnyvale and Santa Clara. Um, and the, uh, okay, so the EPA notes that the groundwater pollution from the Sunnyvale sites has begun to run together underground, creating what they call a commingled plume that extends more than a mile north towards the bay. A reminder, another reminder that the machinery that moves our data creates other flows as well. Um, the offending companies named in the Superfund reports are gone and forgotten, leaving only their contribution to the commingled plume. But somewhat ironically, one of those companies is called Monolithic Memories. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the data center part. Um, and then from there, um, so follow the creek. Um, it goes through some housing subdivisions and then it cuts through a corner of the main Apple campus. So you may have seen images of this campus, but um, most renderings of the spaceship quote unquote campus um, don't include the creek. Um, there's kind of a weird fog at the edges it's kind of like a dismissive hand wave to the actual geographical site as if it could actually be anywhere. Um, like most places in Cupertino, there were once orchards here, in this case, apricot orchards belonging to Scottish immigrants, Robert and Margaret Glendenning, who established their farm in 1851. And I would just point out the barn here because it's, the barn will come up later. Um, but even when I was growing up, there were sort of, I was born in 86, like there were still um, a couple of orchards left. Um, and I think maybe the last one just closed recently. Um, but until, until the 1960s, most of the area was orchards. Um, and for high school students, quote, cutting cots was a common way to spend one summer. Um, when the orchards gave way to shopping centers, subdivisions and tech companies, uh, many people mourned the loss of a semi-rural feeling. Um, but while orchards and tech would seem opposed, fruit production in Cupertino was high tech in its own way, systematic and producing ever higher yields. Um, on the internet archive, I found this strangely pleasing video of an apricot sorting machine, uh, which almost reminds me of fruit as data. Um, and before tech, industrial farming was in its own way an abstraction applied to the land. Um, this is a typical scene from the 1970s. It's a weird mix of tech buildings and remaining orchards. Oh, I should also mention History San Jose is like a, is a just um, local, like historical, not society, but a organization that um, has this like treasure trove of these photos from, um, this period of time in San Jose, Cupertino. Um, so the Glen Denning farm that I just mentioned was sold to Varian, which then sold it to Hewlett Packard HP, um, where my mom would later work as a technical writer. Um, so that's me at my mom's work, because um, uh, she would take me with her sometimes. Uh, and I remember visiting the lobby and trying on a very early version of a VR headset. Um, as I recall, I was on a chessboard and all the chess pieces were bigger than me and I couldn't move, which feels like an apt uh, image of my relationship with technology now. Um, and actually, if you um, go to Street View, um, 
and look this, so this is the Apple campus now. Uh, and you go back in time. That's HP, that's, uh, I mean, you can see a little bit of it there. And then you can also see that there were other companies like Panasonic, but you can see it's already up for lease. Um, so it's, it, and I actually recently went to the, I went inside the Apple campus um, and it was really weird because they asked me if I had ever been there before. And I said <laughs> that technically I had, but it was just like totally different company, different buildings. Um, so, okay, so there's the barn again. Um, I asked my mom if she remembered there being a barn on the campus because I had read that it had stayed and she said that she did, but that she never got to see the inside and that people would hear, have quote beer busts there and that sometimes she would go and get some apricots from the few trees that were left standing around it. Um, Apple acquired the campus in 2010 and demolished it in 2013. My mom sent me this video that she found um, which somebody amazingly, I don't have the sound on, um, but amazingly set to Patsy Cline's song, I Fall to Pieces. Um, on the urging of the Cupertino Historical Society, Apple was compelled to keep the Glen Denning barn, but it dismembered it plank by plank, promising to reassemble it near the fitness center where it would become a quote, hub for employees. So at the time I asked my friend who works there, to find the barn and take photos of it for me. Um, and he asked to remain anonymous because he's not supposed to do that. Um, and it appears that the planks have indeed been reconvened and painted black, but um, as he put it, the barn does not seem to be a hub for anything except landscaping vehicles. Um, and there's another relic at the new campus, but it was created and not preserved. In the center of the circle is an apricot orchard which Steve Jobs hoped would, quote, create a microcosm of old Silicon Valley, a landscape reenactment of the days when the cradle of digital disruption had more fruit trees than engineers. So I asked my friend to take a picture of that too, but it was in the middle of the winter, so it, it's, it's looking a little sad. Um, <laughs> but um, giving the surrounding circumstances, to me, it felt like Baudrillard's description of the simulacrum come to life. While it magically reconstitutes Steve Jobs' childhood memory of the past, at least in the summer, the campus dramatically cuts itself off from the physical fabric of the city surrounding it. What's not necessarily evident in renderings of, of its campus is that it has essentially built up hills around the spaceship, so it's almost impossible to see even when you're right next to it. Um, which, when I was looking at old Street View, I wondered if that's what that giant pile of dirt was <laughs> part of the landscaping. Um, in Sunnyvale, the creek is a flood threat. At Apple, it's a security threat. An environmental impact report was supposed to require Apple to build a trail along the section of the Calabasas Creek, but they objected, writing that, quote, such a trail through a portion of the site would pose security risks because Apple has been the target of intense scrutiny regarding its future projects. Um, in an LA Times article, a Cupertino official is quoted comparing the campus design to a moat. Um, and so I was a bit apprehensive about visiting the creek at this site um, since the LA Times reporters had been chased away by a security guard who mistakenly believed that Apple owned the road. Um, so when I visited, I, <laughs> I parked a mile away at Main Street Cupertino, which is I'll talk about next. And I bought a Phil's coffee, which I don't, uh, that's a very Bay Area joke, but like Phil's coffee is like what? If you've ever watched like Silicon Valley, the show, like they're always going to Phil's coffee. Um, so I bought a Phil's coffee to make myself blend in. Um, and I strolled as casually as possible across the existential landscape over Interstate 280 and down the road that Apple in fact does not own. And so I thought I would give you a sense of that by just on street view um, showing you uh, what this looks like. So um, there's 280. There's the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, my neighborhood, Rancho Rinconado, was just about five minutes in this direction. And then you can see as you're coming down, this is all Apple stuff. Um, so, uh, and I'm gonna skip ahead. So you can see here is the creek. So I went down this road and 
here it is, Calabasas Creek, um, which is dry most of the year. I don't know why, I don't know what's up with this. Um, but yeah, and there's the creek there. Um, and uh, I, for some reason I felt like, I knew it was gonna be there, but I felt like relief when I found it because it's, there's something, I talk about this a lot on how, how to do nothing, like the creek is just there. Nobody put it there. Um, it's a, it's a, the necessity of like water has to go down a mountain and it has to go somewhere. And, and there's no way to sort of engineer it away even when it's going through uh, the Apple campus. Um, and then also, uh, so you can see there that it was dry. Um, this is a video that that same friend of mine who works there um, took on a day when it had rained. So you can see um, that it fills up quite quickly. Um, it was also, it had rained when I went there. So this is my video. Um, so same as it had for decades, the water went on its way, corralled by striated walls of rocks and wire netting. Apple at the time was building something right next to the creek and it had, had encased this mystery in an opaque green wall, which you can see there. I pondered this series of fortifications of Apple against the prying eyes of outsiders and of the land against the water that might erode or overflow it. And I took a moment to enjoy the small admission of pre-existing geography into a place whose products seem so unmoored from the physical. So next, um, the next kind of bit is actually very close to there. It's right here, kind of where it says Lazy Dog Restaurant and Bar. And that's my, that's the high school I went to also, so. Um, all right, so there is one place, uh, I said that Calabasas Creek isn't buried. There are a lot of buried creeks um, in the Bay Area. Um, but there is one place where it is buried. Um, and when I was growing up, it looked like, um, see, looked like this. Um, it was just kind of like a empty field, kind of mystery empty field. Um, and I never thought to take a photo of it because it was just kind of banal. And now I wish I had, um, and if it weren't for old street view, I wouldn't be able to confirm that or get any sort of image of it. And in fact, other than this, the only record I can find of it is in this um, YouTube video uh, called Illegal Dumping Ground Cupertino Finch Avenue and Stevens Creek Boulevard. And um, I'm not playing the sound because uh, uh, since I'm talking, but uh, basically this is filmed by a man in a condo that has just gone up right next to this um, area and he's just like ang angrily filming this guy and then yelling at him like, hey, stop. And like nothing happens. Um, but you can at least kind of see like that it's this big empty field, right? Um, there's not a lot except for this condo that has just gone up. Um, yeah, so you can see it's just kind of empty. Um, and I just, to g I wanna just give a sense of like how remarkable that is, this kind of empty space. Um, so here's more USGS maps. There's the creek in the corner. Um, and then I, uh, that little box is kind of like the area that I'm talking about. So this is 1953. This is 1961. So keep looking at the box. 1963. And then 1980, so it's still empty. Uh, and I never found out why that field remained empty. I don't know if it was like stubborn landlord or something, uh, still don't know. But I wanted to know why the creek went underground there. So I once again turned to my friends at the Santa Clara Valley Water District. Um, and I wanted to know why it was still underground. And in response to my question, they sent me um, a 227 page PDF, which I will show you in a minute, um, that contained original drawings of the rerouting, the engineer's report, the environmental impact review, and various letters from property owners neighbors, officials, and the Sierra Club <laughs> arguing for and against burying the creek. Um, and just to kind of give you some spatial uh, orientation here, uh, this is where we just looked. This is the Apple campus, and this is where the video was made. Um, so I'm gonna open that PDF um, because it's truly epic. Um, you can see 
I literally titled it the Epic Envi <laughs> Environmental Impact Review. Um, and it's just, um, I mean, you can even tell from the table contents, but it just goes on and on. It has like all of the information you would ever want and more. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, lots of amazing stuff in there. Um, and so I'm gonna go to some specific parts. So, uh, so due to erosion, um, the quote unquote uh, creek, oh, because what I found out, sorry, I, I skipped a part. Um, what I found out was that this creek um, was not, again, it's this question of like, what is a creek? Um, this area had been a floodplain. So the creek had spread out into a floodplain at this point because, uh, and the whole barrier formerly was very marshy. Um, and so it had turned into a floodplain and um, farmers in that area had, dug drainage ditches to make the water go through their property. And they they happened to, I mean, for convenience, they dug them in between their properties. So it was basically on the boundaries of their farm properties. Um, and so they're really technically drainage ditches um, that, form, that formed a continuation of the creek. So uh, yeah, yes and no, it's a creek. Um, and then, but because it was done in that way, um, and because of erosion, um, basically the, the drainage ditches started getting like deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, so due to erosion, the quote unquote creek, which had only been four feet wide and two feet deep when it was dug, was now 40 to 100 feet wide and 15 to 30 feet deep. Oh, I realize I'm using feet. Should have converted this to metric, but uh, really deep <laughs> uh, by the time the report was written in 1977. Um, the report speculates that the ditch would continue to widen forever until buildings and trees were threatened. Um, reading this, I envisioned the unruly depression growing ever wider, swallowing Balco Mall, my high school, and the Apple campus, maybe all of Cupertino, turning itself back into the floodplain it once was. Um, so when I realized I forgot to mention Balco. So the descendants of the farmers who, who dug the ditches um, when business started coming in and farming was no longer viable, they formed Balco, I'm gonna come back to Balco, uh, Balco Park Limited, which was a group that managed the land and built a mall that was just to the left of that photo that I showed you of where Apple and the angry YouTube guy was. Um, okay, so the city and trying to deal with this problem, um, they proposed several solutions that were basically variations on two, which was to try to restore it above ground or to bury it and have it go under a tube underground. So you can see different, all of these different things they were, this is the um, having it go underground. Um, and uh, because Balco Park Limited assumed they would be building on the land eventually, and because they had no love for the messy channel, they were in favor of the underground option. And in fact, in my favorite part of, by far of this entire PDF, um, uh, Leonard Burrell, who was the president of Valco Park Limited and the great grandson of one of the farmers who dug the original ditch, wrote a very detailed and very annoyed statement refuting the claims of the Sierra Club. Oh, the Sierra Club is an environmentalist um, advocacy group. Um, so he was refuting the claims of Sierra Club members who wanted to keep it above ground. Um, and so I just want to give you like, this is his long statement, which I, the first thing I want to point out is that he attached um, his resume, um, <laughs> like to his angry letter, uh, which I think is like a really funny move. Um, but this is, yeah, like I said, long angry letter. Um, and okay, so this is the best part. He says, I find it ludicrous when I hear an environmentalist overreaching and overstating and intimating that drainage ditches of this derivation are of great antiquity and beauty and a priceless heritage left to all of us by the unseen hand of an all wise and benevolent nature. Um, and uh, <laughs> that wasn't um, necessarily what the Sierra Club was intimating, but they were concerned about the wildlife corridor and thinking that like raccoons are not gonna wanna go into an underground tunnel. 
Um, but uh, he had no patience for that either. Um, uh, so <laughs> this is him complaining about that. Um, he, uh, uh, other than the couple of quail that Burrell had tried to support with shrubbery that he occasionally saw quote, slumming toward Calabasas or the deer that were last seen in 1908, there was nothing there that he thought was worth saving. Uh, boasting of the great landscaping on existing Velco properties, he wrote, the only large animals who may find habitat pleasing are the employees and customers. Um, and then uh, this is a letter from a local resident, which I don't expect you to be able to read, um, but she, uh, her seven children were forbidden from entering the creek bed and under some hazards, she lists poor creek bed full of rocks and debris, dope addicts, pot smokers, sexual deviants, a suicide, snakes and rats, and no decent wildlife. Um, on top of that, it was a quote, loiter loitering place for students from Cupertino High School, which is my high school. Um, another residence letter mentions packs of loose dogs that have torn living rabbits to shreds. Um, so, <laughs> uh, the compromise was that the half of the section in question, which was the area um, that I'd been looking to next, looking at next to the, camp, the Apple campus, was built above ground with vegetation. Um, so that's a, this is that section. Um, if I didn't know better, I would attribute this scene to the unseen hand of all wise nature and not a bunch of engineers in the 1960s. Um, but the other part, went underground. So that's this part that I was showing here. Let's see if I can see my... Yeah. Um, so this, um, I, if only I had known as a bored teenager that in this field lay buried a seam of apparent, apparently total lawlessness filled with rats and snakes. Um, but this field did not remain empty. So period is in 2008. Um, 2009, let's see. So something happening in 2013, 2016. Okay. And then, ta da, uh, Main Street Cupertino. Um, for me, as someone who grew up whining about the lack of an actual downtown in Cupertino, um, the idea that an ersatz downtown would suddenly appear on the mysterious empty lot is almost too much. Um, each storefront when I visited was playing its own outdoor music to the empty sidewalks. Some things that appeared to be cafes were actually Apple offices. And outside of the Phil's coffee, um, I found a giant Apple core sculpture, possibly a weird direct, indirect homage to Apple. Um, the Yelp reviews for Main Street Cupertino, I tend to agree with. Uh, it is kind of just the same old <laughs> shit wrapped up in a big ass parking clusterfuck. Um, also, I appreciated why do we, we call it Main Street more like Lame Street. Anyway, that's just kind of more of the same like Cupertino stuff that I didn't like as a teenager. Um, but this time with social media accounts. Um, and I thought it was somehow appropriate that the image on its website was not, not even a photo, but either a 3D rendering or a physical model, presumably from before it existed. Um, and then as far as Valco Mall with its lovely landscaping for privileged large animals and customers, um, it's, oh, there it is. Um, when it opened in 1978, there was so much enthusiasm that an entire Valco shaped cake was made for opening day and a marching band went through the mall. It was a verdant state of the art 70s mall and it stayed that way for some time. Um, I spent many days there as a kid, uh, there I am, throwing pennies into the fountains, skating in the ice rink, buying bumper stickers at Hot Topic. Um, but I think I could already tell that it felt somehow dated, like I was a 90s kid living in a faded, faded 70s dream. And in the 2000s, Falco started to empty out dramatically until only a few tenants were left. This was the scene that you had to walk through to see a movie at the AMC theater that was attached 
And when I last visited, the mall was haunted by lonely stacks of chairs and a woman's face peeling off a store window. Um, at one time, there had been a plan to demolish Valco and replace it with something called Valco Hills, which would have been a mixed use neighborhood. And on this incredibly overbuilt web website, revitalizedvalco.com, um, you can see that it's kind of like smushed under like a kind of park thing. Um, the Valco Hills plan would have covered the entire thing in vineyards, something architectural renderings imagined healthful residents jogging peacefully through. And this pop-up manifestation of the California ideal wouldn't have been too dissimilar from the orchard inside the Apple campus, except that it never happened. Um, Cupertino voters rejected the plan in 2016. And by the last time I last visited Valco, even the mall's informational display for that idea was long abandoned. And when my boyfriend Joe visited it in early 2019, it looked like this. Um, it turns out that not just creek banks, but real estate dreams can erode. Um, and just as a side note, um, a friend of mine uh, shot a music video. So this has been demolished now. Um, he shot a music video on it right before it went down, which I just will show a little bit of because it's amazing. I just I'm so glad that um, he was able to do that before <laughs> before it got um, demolished. Um, okay, so the la very last part, um, just quickly. Uh, so it goes past um, my high school, then it goes through neighborhoods like with names like Alderbrook and Brookdale, and then it ends up here in the hills. Um, and these hills are home not to houses, but to estates. Um, so just to give you some idea, um, this is Saratoga on Zillow. And you can see that um, there are basically a lot of mansions um, that are in the like, uh, you know, 3 million and above. Um, and so the, this is the headwaters of the creek. It's basically right in here. Um, and uh, I just wanted to show just a tiny bit of this amazing real estate video that is very um, uh, exemplary of Santa or of Saratoga real estate or Silicon Valley real estate in general. Andy T with the T Group. I'm super excited to bring you my newest listing, 21194 Hay Meadow Drive in Saratoga, California. You know, we're less than a mile away from downtown Saratoga, but you're going to find yourself transported to the rolling hills of Tuscany as we walk inside this Mediterranean themed estate that was custom built in 2000. The house itself has over 4,000 square foot living space in the main house, four bedrooms and three and a half bathrooms. And there's a guest house with one bedroom, one bath and just under 400 square square feet. No expense has been spared in the design and building of this home, whether it be the imported terracotta roof tiles from Florence, Italy, or the reclaimed floorboards from a mill in France. You're going to love everything this house has to offer. Are you ready? Let's go inside and take a closer look. Okay, so we don't need to go inside and take a closer look, but um, <laughs> uh, you could see also the hills around that, that area. Um, and, and so in this area, the creek winds past these mansions in an idyllic natural form. 
no longer a threat, but an aesthetic amenity to residents complete with private paths and footbridges. And uh, Saratoga has long been the land of the rich. At the same time that the orchards were popping up in Cupertino and Sunnyvale, the elite of San Francisco were discovering this section of the Santa Cruz Mountains as a place for vacations and summer homes. Um, not far from here is Villa Montalvo, a Sarato Saratoga arts institution and former country home of James Phelan, who was the mayor of San Francisco at the turn of the century, and who, by the way, sought to restrict immigration from Asian countries and thought half Asians were degenerates. That's me. Um, but for those without country homes, the real local attraction was something called Congress Springs. Um, and this would sound more familiar to someone in the US, but uh, the name Saratoga uh, sounds familiar to a lot of people because of Saratoga, New York, which is where the actual original Congress Springs was. Um, quote, taking the waters or taking the cure um, at a hot springs was a fashionable thing to do at the time. So a couple of local business tycoons built a 14 room hotel and resort, started bottling the water and named their operation after the resort in New York. So not only is there an obsession in general in that area with like Tuscany, but also like in this case, just like New York. Um, and it was a big enough deal that uh, the, a branch of the 19th century interurban railroad was built to bring San Franciscans up the hill to Congress Springs. Um, in a savvy act of branding, the city voted in 1865 to simply name itself after Saratoga, New York. So it's called Saratoga. Um, and even closer to, to the, the path of the Calabasas Creek was another hot springs and thus another business opportunity. Um, this is where the Azul Seltzer Company packaged the water in these bottles and sold it at grocery stores throughout the Bay Area. And reading the description of their product, I'm reminded of that Californian brand of health obsessed hype. So they wrote, the Azul water has a carbonated and pungent taste. The action is antacid, aperient, diuretic, and tonic, and is of great service in dyspepsia, torpidity of the liver and intestinal tract, increasing the process of secretion and excretion and eliminating morbific waste materials in the visceral and cutaneous systems. That's like all, that doesn't mean anything. Um, so amazingly, the thing that gave Saratoga its name only lasted 50 years and is now nowhere to be found. In 1901, almost the entire Pacific Congress Springs resort burned to the ground after a fire started in the kitchen. No one was hurt. Um, the result, resort was never rebuilt and the site was used as a picnic grounds until the San Jose Water Company closed it off to the public. And five years before he died in 2013, the Saratoga historian Willie's Peck wrote about going there as a kid and drinking the water. Um, but when he borrowed a key from the water company and visited the site as an adult, he couldn't find the springs anymore. Um, the Azul site is also gone. It's memorialized in the book by Tobin Gilman that looks at the 19th century Bay Area through the lens of bottles. Um, and when he posted images of the Azul seltzer bottles on Facebook, a few people's comments gave clues to the fate of the spring. So here's this album that I found. Um, and so you can see like this guy writes like, I lived on Mount Eden Road in the 70s and 80s, hiked through the property and there were still footbridges and resort buildings. The owner at the time was notorious for taking in stray cats. And there were hundreds of hundreds staring at us as we walked down the main driveway back to the road. If Alfred Hitchcock had made a movie called The Cats, he could have filmed it there never did find an Azul Springs bottle. Um, also side note, I followed Tobin Gilman on Twitter um, because after this project and I didn't realize that he's like a total like conservative wing nut. Um, so hates liberals, but loves bottles. Um, I unfollowed him on Twitter. Um, so, um, so while a hot spring can appear and disappear, a creek remains as long as there is rain to move down a mountain. And maybe this is why I'm so obsessed with the idea of this very old channel and why I felt the need to follow it to its headwaters. Um, at this point on the map, uh, Calabasas Creek doesn't show up on the map, so I had to guess. Driving past the mansions, I parked and walked up the Mount Eden Trail following the sound of water and stooping below a fallen tree to see the very beginnings of the creek. As history overturns and the fads of Silicon Valley come and go, the water flows every winter and it flows in the same direction. Long before it became a flood liability and a threat to security, and before its steelhead and rainbow trout were extinguished, the creek might have been not only noticed, but provident to the Ohlone, the first residents of this place. Almost everything about Calabasas Creek is now adulterated, 
starting with pollution and ending with its straight jacketed course toward the bay, past the former floodplain where it used to come to rest. And yet some version of it remains, following it up into the mountains or even into the modified ditches that replaced the floodplain is a reminder of the shape of this seemingly placeless place of the valley in Silicon Valley. Even in the midst of a slurb made of corporate franchises and walled tech gardens, it's not possible to be nowhere any more than it is for us to engineer away the water during a flood or stop cracks from appearing in pavement. Water moves and land moves. Nothing on earth ever stands still. Um, a few days after I visited Calabasas Creek, it rained torrentially in Oakland. I live on a steep hill. And as I walk down my street, I realize why it was so hard to define what a creek is. It's not only that in some places it feels indistinguishable from infrastructure. It's that a creek is just one form of water that needs to go somewhere and water always needs to go somewhere. I watched a temporary river crossing the street thinking about how the next day it would be gone. Calabasas Creek too is more of a, an event than an entity. It's technically not a creek, but an arroyo, meaning that it's dry most of the year and only runs in the winter. The rest of the time, the sunken pathway through Apple and the concrete channel in Sunnyvale sits empty, like place settings for a dinner guest who only shows up once a year. In fact, Calabasas Creek was dry the first time I visited it as an adult, accompanied by my friend Josh, who had also grown up near the creek without noticing it. Um, we used it as a trail, a surreal perspective on the familiar from the very middle of everything. Besides the cement bags I remembered seeing as a five-year-old, some loitering Cupertino high school students, um, just like that lady complained about, um, and a dark tunnel of graffiti that led under Cupertino Main Street, that's what's up there. Um, one thing caught my eye. The creek bed was made of riprap, a kind of rocky mix in which some of the material is taken from demolitions and was probably added sometime in the late 20th century as part of flood related creek improvements. Upon closer inspection, one of these rocks was actually a piece of a brick building that had been molded by water into a natural looking shape. I found this quote rock emblematic. Although Valco businessman Leonard Burrell would likely accuse me of overreaching and overstating, thinking about the creek reminds me of the reality of water and of seasons, of how badly we've designed everything and of how much is currently borrowed against the ecological future a kind of floodplain of despair that is ditched and routed underground in my consciousness. But no matter what happens long after Cupertino is gone, the water will still run down the mountain every year and it will still shape the rocks no matter what they are made out of. Um, so that is my talk and I leave you with this address if you <laughs> want to um, look at the creek um, on Street View and explore on your own. This is where it crosses through the Apple campus. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much, Jenny. And it's been, I'm now paraphrasing already, the first question we have from the chat, it's been a, such a charming talk and walk. Um, I go straight with the first question, if you don't mind. Uh, Alexander Strecker is asking, well, first of all, thank you. I feel, I feel so relaxed, but I have a question. From the incredibly localized and grounded attention of your methodology, can you imagine some kind of politics emerging? I mean politics in a broad sense. The simple answer might be a local politics, but I wonder if you have thought about the potential scalability of this method. I hate that word and recognize it's abused by, used and abused by tech, but that's why I'm wondering if you see some way of reclaiming scale, marrying the local with something that could be extended further? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that um, that my, I, I elaborated a little more in, in the book, How to Do Nothing, um, as I think I am trying to go in that direction um, of this kind of insistence on, on the local um, and scale, it's funny, this is, may not seem that related, but I just started reading this morning, this amazing New Yorker article that I highly recommend about WeWork, um, like the startup WeWork. And they interview this guy who was basically doing like a, a sane version of WeWork um, and couldn't get any venture capitalist money because um, he wasn't making the same like wild promises as WeWork. Um, 
and he the way he articulates like like uh, there's something in Silicon Valley that feels like antithetical to the idea of like thinking small <laughs> of course like as they mentioned right it's been appropriated but um like thinking small and like actually sustainably and like not not having to like like global domination doesn't need to be part of your plan right <laughs> like um and I just like the way he articulates it's so great so I really recommend that but um but yeah I think um uh there there is something about I'm not really sure how to articulate it but I think I was motivated in the book how to do nothing in general by the idea that the things that people need um, for a sense of identity and recognition and meaning are actually um, close at hand um, in some cases and that you could sort of like turn towards that kind of network um, and towards like history and responsibility and ecological stewardship um, and find the things that you think that you're looking for in other places and that things like social media are kind of exacerbating that feeling of needing to find meaning um, that's kind of that answer was all over the place. Um, basically, the answer is like yes. I do think it should, could be elaborated um, and and uh, form the basis of a politics. Yeah. And uh, we do have another question from Alice. In this case, uh, she's she says that uh, it's a semi-unrelated question, uh, but if that's okay, if that she loves to hear a bit about your new book book on time. Oh yeah, I mean it is kind of related. It is actually. Quite related. Um, so um, yeah, the book I, I just I'm working on chapter one right now. Um, I'm writing a book about different temporalities, like learning to see and perceive different temporalities. I mean, the most obvious one would be like capitalist time versus ecological time, but there's many other um, kind of examples of that. And um, and so right now I'm working on this very stressful chapter about the history of of the idea that time is money in the in the strictly economic sense, like wages, basically, um, and uh, wages and tailorization and automation and just this kind of like drive to make time be money in the most sort of exact way. Um, and so I think it's been really interesting working on that chapter while I'm, you know, during the pandemic. Um, depending on you know whether you have the luxury of working from home or not i think a lot of people including me are more aware of ecological time because you're in one place and you know like i i've noticed the the colors of the trees like changing more this year than i normally do um and so that con i've been living that contrast that i'm hoping to write about and i think as i said at the end of this talk um one of the reasons that um like ge geology and ecology and watersheds and things like this appeal to me is because of their time scale. So like I find something actually quite comforting and grounding in the fact that Calabasas Creek represents something that was there um, before Cupertino, long before Cupertino, you know, before me, before, you know, it's just kind of a priori, it's there. Um, and, um, and so I've been thinking more about that and also um, unsurprisingly, maybe getting very into geology. So um, I've been, uh, I just ordered these two giant maps of the Santa Cruz mountains that just um, arrived yesterday. Um, and I've just been kind of like pouring over them and really like trying to get a sense of like, okay, well, like where's the fault, geological fault line and like, why is there this mountain here? And, and again, that's very much like an expression of time, geological time. Um, Yokaishi is asking if you saw birds around the creek <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely did. Um, I think once you start to get towards like um, where like that photo that I showed of my friend with the fence, like that part of the creek starts to be much more, um, has much more vegetation and trees. And then there's also birds actually really love suburban neighborhoods because there's so much stuff to eat. So there start to be a lot of birds there. But I, I did have a, uh, an analogous feeling with birds that I had with the creek overall, which was there's I don't know if creepy is the right word, but there is this kind of strange feeling of becoming aware of something that was there the whole time, right? So like, um, while some of the birds that I heard or saw at those creek, like they're ubiquitous here, right? Like California towies, uh, white crowned sparrows, like these kind of like 
usual, usual suspects. Clearly, I heard that as a kid. I had to have heard that sound. And in a way, it feels sort of familiar, but right below the level of consciousness. And I just, I really, I think that that's how I feel about the creek too, right? Like, clearly, there were times when I was in my car driving, and I looked and I saw, like, water, but it just didn't quite make it into my consciousness. So um, I had the same feeling with, yeah, with the birds that I saw and the trees and the plants and all that stuff. And uh, Daniel is asking about uh, your, like, I mean, your work process and how you create these narratives, how you synthesize uh, all this research on into a narrative. Uh, of course, uh, the talk that you gave today, it's included in the chapter in the book and uh, it's also medium published online uh, that can be accessible. But I was wondering how you, how you create like, like uh, how you create these narratives, how, how you adapt them to different uh, outputs, no? Because it can, they can become a, a, a chapter in a book, an exhibition, maybe a website. How is, how is that work process? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's not as um, considered as it could be. I mean, I made it originally a talk because the prompt was from the Prelinger Library was to give a talk. Um, and so uh, that's, and then I, and then also on top of that, this, this example in particular, I have a very easy thread, right? Which is the creek. So like, you're kind of like given like a thread to, to organize things. Whereas like, you kind of have to, that might be more abstract um, otherwise. Um, but I think that like many things, I mean, many, if you're, many research projects that you're actually very interested in could kind of be anything like they could be adapted to anything. And um, I mean, I, How to Do Nothing, the book is based on a talk. So, you know, it's like, um, I just, I think that there are different ways, different explanatory mechanisms for the same information. Um, and it's been really interesting to, to use different ones and see like, and then sort of borrow things from one context and bring them to another. Um, I have a question, but maybe just wearing a little bit uh, my my hat of working in a photography institution, because I think, and I was chatting with, with John throughout your talk, and I was saying like, these images uh, look almost like they're fight, fighting against each other. You know, like you have all these different visions or even, um, you know, like different um, views which are trying to conquer our visions of the same space, which I find very interesting. So I, I, and also maybe going back to this idea of how it would work as an exhibition or how it would work even in this, in, in this talk, you know, like it, it felt like um, going through such different um, ideas that try to, or even ideologies, right, like of a specific place and how do you feel about that in terms of like the role of images in, inside this work specifically and maybe also in general? Yeah, I, I think I, I really um, enjoy like trying to seek out like almost like a kaleidoscopic perspective on something like I'm even thinking about um, the, you know, I mentioned it in the book, but the residency that I did at the dump in San Francisco, you know, where I researched um, all of these discarded objects and I would kind of subject them to a really similar process as I did to the creek here, which is like, what is what is everything I can find about this object? You know, and a lot of things in, the, in that dump were from the 70s, so, um, or earlier. And so it's like, there, you might be able to find like a commercial for it on YouTube and then you find reviews uh, you find what people said about it at the time, you find reviews of it now, you find it on eBay, like, um, and it's in front of you and people have come into the, you know, I remember like there was something I didn't even know what it was and another older employee of the dump came in and said, oh, that's a blah, 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 which like I wouldn't know because it's kind of like before my time. And so it's just like, really depends on like who's looking at it and like what familiar familiarity they have and like what framework they're using to talk about it. And I really like like taking all of those and like smushing them together because it really kind of like destabilizes the object. Um, and, and I think it also further suggests the effect that it has on me is like when you have that experience with an object or a place, then you go and you walk outside, everything looks like that, right? Like you're just like, I don't know what anything is. Like, 
uh, I have my understanding of this street that I live on, but like, it, that's so specific, you know, and it's like, so, um, so narrow. Um, and so it can be like very exhilarating, but also disorienting, I think, because there is no, you can't, don't really come to rest anywhere. Like, it's just this kind of like constant, and, and especially now that there's so much information online, you can find really almost anything. I mean, not, you know, many different perspectives. Uh, and uh, maybe a last question on the, like, uh, on the relationship that you might have with Google, because uh, uh, <laughs> you've done some works uh, using Google Studio Imaginary, and then you also have like a, another work that was, if I'm not mistaken, was shown on the on the premises of Google as well. So, mm -hmm. um, what's the uh, that's a quite like usual question in the photography world. Also, when using images taken from Google, what's like the, the legal relationship with with them? Yeah, it's so funny. This doesn't happen as much anymore, but I used to get so many emails from people who from artists that wanted to use Google Maps imagery, and they would ask me about the legality because they thought that I would know because I use it. And I was like, you know what? I don't have a good answer. Like I am just on apparently on their good side. Um, <laughs> so they don't like, they haven't sued me. Um, and which makes sense, right? If you're an artist and you, it's like probably makes them look good, right? Like if you're doing something with their imagery, but um, yeah, I did in 2011, I did exhibit some of my work that had Google satellite imagery in it in the maps building in a stairwell. Um, and I remember meeting the guy or one of the guys who made the thing that became Street View. So before it was acquired by Google. And I remember asking him like, what do you do with old Street View? Um, and he said, I don't know, but maybe someday there'll be like a slider where you can like go back in time. And we're like, wow, that would be so cool. And like, now you can, it's like, now you can do that. Um, so uh, yeah, it's um, like I said, there's no, there's no like systematic reason why it's like been okay for me to use Google Street View imagery, but it's been a really useful research tool for sure. There's one very last question that um, if we have one more minute, I'd like to pass on from the chat from Arianna Guidi. Um, very inspiring. Thank you very much for the talk. Jenny, do you think that the practice of seeing and hearing could create new modes of knowledge production to overcome the spectacle? Oh yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I I hope so. Um, that's kind of what I am, my, my, whole, uh, my whole thing. I mean, I talk about, um, in How to Do Nothing, I talk about Pauline Oliveros, who was the sound artist and musician who, who sort of coined the term deep listening. Um, and she really talks about it as quite, you know, almost endurance, like kind of active practice um, that that is on, feels um, difficult because everything about, especially American culture, is that you're supposed to have a snap judgment on everything. Um, and, you know, very instant gratification, um, something is good or it's bad, you know, very reactive. So it really takes a lot of discipline to not, to just not engage with that. And then to kind of like hold the space of your attention open longer, like longer and longer, ideally. Um, and so I, at least in my personal experience, like, I don't know, I think that's like a secret weapon <laughs> in this day and age, right? Is to just like simply like make use of one's observational abilities longer and more deeply than we're sort of trained to. Um, and that it's, um, I mean, this is an odd example, but sometimes I talk about if you have to look at ads, like if you're in a situation where like, let's say you're like, um, you need to look at something and it has ads in it. Um, like you, you don't have the decision of whether or not to look at them. You do, I, I always in that situation, I like adopt this stance of like, um, I look at the ads as if they were written by a sci-fi writer in like 50 years ago about the future, like now. Um, so like almost like the Blade Runner, the ads you see in Blade Runner, like just look at all ads like that. It's amazing, you know, like uh, you will be able to like read so many things into these images. And then you just start asking questions like, why did they choose that color? And like, why, like, what, why does this word? And like, just, you know, like if you just kind of, I think that it's not just a, a matter of like 
depth and length, but again, coming back to like perspective, you just take like a, a slightly askew angle on anything it becomes very strange. And like, and then I think you have a little bit more agency in terms of like, like just kind of holding it and like looking at it instead of having it like, just like wash over you and just react in the way that you're supposed to. Thank you. I think that that's like a perfect, in fact, ending for the for the talk. Uh, gives like a, a good tool to to move forward from here from here on. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for for all your time for the talk and uh, for sharing all this uh, research that you've done, uh, Jenny, with us. It's been a pleasure to to have you with us to, tonight. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure.